All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mr. Brown's World History Class. Uh, today's lesson is my final lesson on the French Revolution and Napoleon. Before I get into today's lesson, I just want to remind everybody what happened to the first president of France. Here's what happened to him right here. Things didn't work out too well for Maximilien Robespierre. He thought he could cut off the heads of everyone he didn't like, and he ends up getting his own dang head cut off. So, uh, let's hope that the next president of France is uh, going to fare quite a bit better. All right, so here's our new stuff today. Today is all about this guy, Napoleon Bonaparte. And let me tell you how he became a uh, important figure in history. Well, so after Maximilian got his head chopped off, for around five years, there was a new government in France called the Directory, I believe. And the Directory really wasn't that good. Uh, things in France got progressively worse because there were these five or ten guys in charge. They couldn't make any executive decisions. And after five years, the people of France were, were definitely growing frustrated. So this young military officer named Napoleon Bonaparte decided that he and a bunch of his friends would take over the country. They did it in a pretty interesting style. It's uh, now known as a coup d'etat, or just a coup, where what he did was he allied himself with the guards in the presidential palace, or the directory's, um, I don't know, building, and he said, all right, we're going to just walk in there and arrest everybody, and we'll take over the country and we'll make it run better. And coup d'etat is a style of taking over a country that has been done now multiple times by a lot of different people. But Napoleon was definitely the most famous guy to get it all going. So, that's Napoleon, how he took over. Uh, you know, history... Uh, Napoleon's an interesting guy in history because he technically isn't even French. I think I might say this later. Uh, he's from the island of Corsica, which is sort of this island between Italy and France. And growing up, he had a lot more of an Italian vibe, yet he somehow is more connected to French history than anything else. All right, so hopefully you're all writing this down in your notes. Let's check out Napoleon. So here he is, a young guy taking over France, doing his thing. Ah, see, I said it right here. Uh, yeah, Napoleon was born in Corsica, and people imagine that Napoleon looks something like this. But uh, in reality... He was an average height guy. He was not a short dude. But uh, there is actually a, a concept in English called a Napoleon complex where a short person is really bossy or likes to have a lot of power. So if you ever, uh, if you ever find a short person who's pushy, then you, know, you could say they have a Napoleon complex. Uh, so the question is, how did this... Uh, I, think he, I, I don't think he really was from wealth. I think he was a generally poor guy from this random island near Italy, how did he take over France? Well, it's largely because he knew how to motivate people. He was really good at politics. He had the right friends. Now, sometimes just that's how history works. You're just the right person at the right time. So these are some of the islands he was from. And then there's Napoleon getting in charge. And he, this is not true. This is historically inaccurate. He was an average height guy. So, Napoleon takes over the country and almost immediately declares himself ruler for life. Whoa! And here's the whole thing, kids. It's like the French people wanted a republic. They killed their king. They killed Robespierre. And now this third guy is coming in here saying, I'm ruler for life. Well, the people of France were... Actually, okay with Napoleon. I'm going to tell you why. Because he did not overindulge himself with luxuries. Like, yeah, he did have some fanciness. And I think he did have, like, a tiny palace. But he was nowhere near the scale of Louis uh, the Sixteenth or Robespierre. He really did focus on improving life for the people. He was all about using that wealth to improve France. Uh, and what he did was he was tired of putting France on the defense. His whole young life, he was one of those soldiers that fought 
to kind of keep France uh, free. He fought all those Habsburg armies that invaded. And he said, why don't we go on the offense? There's all kinds of poor people who are being abused by European kings all over Europe. And if we give them the chance, they will rally against the European kings and join us. So he sets himself up with this mission of, I'm going to, you know, totally go to war with the Habsburg family and kick them all out of Europe. I'm going to spread these revolutionary ideals everywhere I go, and I'm going to be unstoppable. And I'll tell you, historically speaking, Napoleon pretty much was. He was an amazing general, and his soldiers believed in what they were fighting for. And because of that, this guy's going to be freaking awesome in the battlefield. Um, but there is definitely a historical uh, controversy with Napoleon. His whole thing was, I'm going to kick out all the monarchs and all the kings, but... He set himself up to be ruler for life, so wasn't he a king? Um, and yeah, that is that is kind of a mixed bag legacy with Napoleon, so he's a debatable figure. Uh, all right, so yes, some people saw Napoleon as this, and it's true, he did, you know, get this picture taken of himself, makes him look like some kind of fancy king. But this is where you would usually see Napoleon, dressed as a soldier, fighting on the front lines with his bros, being a dude. And uh, another thing you can notice about Napoleon, he does this thing where he puts his hand in his in his chest pocket like that. That's kind of interesting. You'll you maybe see something about that in a video later. Um, yep, Napoleon. All right. So between 1807 to 1812, Napoleon was constantly at war. It was like five years of never-ending wars. It was just a war with Spain, and then a war with Germany, and a war with Italy, and a war with Egypt, and a war with Italy again. Like it just was on and on and on. But every war he fought during this period, Napoleon was a winner. Eventually, all of Europe was under his control. He just beat everybody. His army was so big, because just as I said, everywhere his soldiers went, he just recruited the, the poor middle class people from Spain, from Italy, from Germany. And they fought against their kings, and they were winning. He's, he's the Habsburg enemy number one. And you can't stop this, bro. So, yeah, check it out right there. The Grand Army. Well, maybe, maybe you guys got all this. Yeah, it's just one sentence. Uh, here he is, you know, leading the battle. He was a, he was a front-line kind of guy, too. He was not going to hide in the back with everyone else. Um, and uh, let, let me just tell you some more stuff he did. And you don't have to write this down. But uh, all the political offices were elected. So he did keep some democracy in his country. Uh, he was very connected with the citizens. I remember reading stories that soldiers would share meals with Napoleon. Napoleon would be kind of walking around his army and like high fiving guys. So he was he was a, a man of the people. Um, but he is a mixed bag because he did try to bring back slavery, and slavery had already been illegal for almost a hundred years. But Napoleon, kind of a racist. Okay, actually, a big racist. And he wanted slavery to return to France's colonies. He also, pretty sexist guy. Uh, some people were saying, hey, maybe women should get the right to vote. Napoleon thought that was dumb. He also thought women should technically not be allowed to own property. And I do believe in some parts of his laws, he said that women should be considered as property. So, yeah, he definitely, definitely wouldn't be cool with uh, some of our new... Uh, concepts that go against those today. So, anyway, here's Napoleon leading his guys, being a bro. There's Napoleon hearing about new laws. Definitely was not a fan of women or minorities. Um, but, uh, oh, this is something important to mention. So, in one of those wars Napoleon fought, he took over Spain, and he replaced the king of Spain with his brother. And this is going to cause some international issues because Spain had been focusing so much on controlling their territories in our part of the world, in you know, Mexico and South America, that when Napoleon imprisons the Spanish king, the peoples in the Americas now have to make the choice. Are we still loyal to our king who's in jail or are we now loyal to Napoleon or are we just going to 
say, hey, Europe, we're not dealing with y'all no more. Um, and I'm going to get into this in the next unit, so I just wanted to mention this, that there's going to be some ramifications of what Napoleon is doing in Europe all the way in our part of the world. So, yeah, here's a famous massacre that happened in Spain. These are all Napoleon soldiers killing some Spanish guys. Um, okay, and yeah, this is, this is the thing, kids. Napoleon created the biggest country in Europe's history. All this in the red right here was Napoleon's super kingdom. And he goes real deep into Russia later. And he gets more land than the Nazis ever did. Uh, he gets more land than the Roman Empire did. So if you're the kind of person who tries to keep track of who's the, uh, the, the greatest conqueror in world history, Napoleon is definitely up there. And his whole vibe was, I'm battling these bad kings, and I'm going to bring liberty to the people of Europe. Um, but then again, he was also kind of a king himself. And he also didn't bring liberty to women or minorities. So, mixed bag. Mixed bag of the guy. Uh, Alright, keep moving on. So, here's where things start to get bad for our uh, French-Italian friend. Uh, Napoleon really made a bad call when he attacked Russia during the winter of 1812. When he did this, he invaded Russia with the biggest army Europe has ever seen. And the Russian king, in a very smart decision, decided to constantly retreat deeper and deeper into Russia. And he had his guys burn all the food, poison all the wells, and they never actually fought Napoleon with, like, guns and stuff. He just constantly retreated. Russia's a big country. And as Napoleon's men were trying to chase down the Russian army, they couldn't find any food, they couldn't find any uh, fresh water, and then it started to snow. And that's where things got even more complicated. Because it was the coldest winter in Russia's history. Russia got really lucky right there. And Napoleon's guys didn't have the supplies. They didn't have the provisions. So Napoleon goes all the way to Moscow. Takes over the city. But then because there's no food. He says guys we gotta turn around. And they're like bro. We just walked 3,000 miles. You want us to walk 3,000 miles back? He's like yeah. And on their walk back. Napoleon lost 90% of his guys. Um, so the, the Russian military wasn't the big concern. It was the weather. So yeah, things are bad. So there's Napoleon. These guys are just freezing their, their bums off. Don't attack Russia in the winter. Big mistake. Um, okay. So when Napoleon returns from his retreat in Russia, the Russian army catches up to him, and the Russian army surrounds him and captures him. Um, Napoleon then just says, all right, I give up. What do you want me to do? Now, the Habsburg kings and the Russians said, hey, we should kill this guy. But other people said, well, he is kind of an important dude. He did give up. We should, we should give him some respect. So they decided that they would exile Napoleon. They would give him one island near the island where he was born, island right off the coast of Italy called Elba, and they said, you know, Napoleon, you can rule over that island for the rest of your days, but you can never ever leave that island. You're basically a prisoner on it, but, you know, we'll give you some money, we'll give you a fancy house, you'll get to eat nice, like, think of it like a forced retirement where you can never leave. And, uh, I, Napoleon was, was cool with that at first, but after, like, two years, like, look, th this is a guy who is already in the history books as having conquered the most European land ever. Uh, he's not going to be satiated by just living out the rest of his days on a tiny island near Italy. He was a dude who had big ambitions, and all kinds of people were sending him letters being like, Napoleon, come back. Napoleon, please. You know, like, they're, they're going to bring King Louis the Seventeenth to take over France. Like, we can't have that. Um, so Napoleon was, was definitely uh, doing rough right there. Uh, all right, so I hope everybody's cool with this slide. I'm going to just keep moving on. And then, yeah, here's a little political cartoon to show you it. You know, Napoleon's riding this uh, donkey, also called a jackass, on his way to Elba. 
He has a broken sword, shows his military was defeated. Uh, and Fontainebleau, that was the name of his palace uh, in... Well, it's not... Well, actually, I've been to Fontainebleau. It's not quite a palace, but it was a big fancy house near Paris. And so, yeah, Napoleon, he's crying, and these people are laughing at him. So, he's, uh... He's uh, not going to be happy there. And what ultimately happened was Napoleon was just too ambitious. After a couple years on that island, he was like, you know what? I'm going to give it one more try. He escapes from Elba. He returns to France. And as he's riding through the French countryside, the people of France are just ecstatic to have him back. He was immediately reinstated as the Emperor of France for life, and he was given a second chance to try to take over the dang world. And for a hundred days, he you know, reset the French government, he raised an army of his old soldiers, and he got totally prepped up for round two. Okay, but this time around... All of Europe was united against him. They were also sending their militaries to get ready for one big battle. And that is exactly what's going to go down. All right. So here's Napoleon. This dude's probably trying to make out with him. And here's all these soldiers being like, bro, you're back. So good to see you. Okay. So Napoleon's big army. This was probably one of the major battles in the whole history of the world. Faced off against this united european super military in the country of belgium at a place called waterloo and look i could tactically analyze this battle but it was it was set to be a pretty even fight what ultimately happened was was napoleon's brother the same one who took over spain i believe uh he got lost with like 30 percent of the military and napoleon's guys got surrounded and Napoleon uh, did surrender a second time. And rather than let Napoleon return to Elba, the European kings learned their lesson. They're like, look, that, that island is too close to Europe. There were so many people talking to him all the time. He was living this kind of luxurious life. We're not going to give him that choice again. They sent him all the way to this island random island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, south of South Africa, this island called St. Helena. And he was not living a luxurious life there. He was a prisoner. He was surrounded by guards all the time. He couldn't see his wife. He couldn't see his kids. And there he died 10 years later. So that's uh, ultimately what happened to Napoleon. So let's check it out. Okay. The, the Battle of Waterloo. So it's pretty cool. Big old fights and the great battles of our time. All right, this is, a, this is a big little thing here that I want to read because I think it's kind of interesting. So when Napoleon was kicking it in his prison in uh, the island of St. Helena for the last 10 years of his life, there was a bunch of people that, you know, came there to interview him and to write books about him and stuff. And uh, this, this is a pretty cool exchange that happened there. So a reporter asked him, what do you think of all the things in the world would give you the greatest pleasure in life? And then Napoleon said, To be able to go about unseen in London and other parts of England, to restaurants with a friend, to dine in public at the expense of a few bucks, to listen to the conversation of company, this and the education of my son would be my greatest pleasure. It was my intention to have done this had I reached America. The happiest days of my life were from 16 to 20, during college, when I used to go about, as I have told you, from one restaurant to another, living moderately, having a lodging for which I paid 300 bucks a month. Those were the happiest days of my life. I was always so occupied that I was never happy on the throne. Yeah, I think that's some deep stuff. Like, this, this dude is, like, forever enshrined in world history, but if he had the choice to live it all over again, he wouldn't. You would you just want to be an average person like everybody else. So that's pretty cool. Um, all right, and there's St. Helena. So, yeah, way far away from Europe. He's never going to escape that island. And he never did. He lived the rest of his life out there. And uh, we did actually find, this is some recent historical knowledge, uh, they uh, figured out that Napoleon was poisoned to death. 
while he was on that island, his British captors slowly poisoned him with the food they were giving him. And he did, I think he, he was, he was young through so much of this story. I think he died when he was in his like 60s. So, yep, that's, uh, that's the end of Napoleon. Uh, okay, now let's uh, just say the legacy of all these events in the French Revolution. There's this pretty fantastic building in Paris, I've seen it myself, called the Arc de Triomphe. And it's a testimonial to Napoleon's army's amazing ability to take over all of Europe and spread the revolution. And uh, I'll zoom in on this, but you can see some like French soldiers and stuff etched into this giant arch. And what happened was, after this whole episode of Napoleon, all the Habsburg kings came back. And they all, like, resumed their thrones, got back into their palaces. But they weren't absolute monarchs anymore. Napoleon's army did damage that would never be undone. The peoples of Spain, Italy, Germany, they all now knew what revolution felt like. They all now knew the sort of value of choosing your leaders. They were infected with the French Revolution. And absolute monarchs started to give away their power, and democracies and republics popped up all around Europe. So the age where a king could just spend millions and millions of dollars while his people suffer, that will never again happen to Europe. And we can thank the uh, people of France for that. So, all right, I'll keep moving on. All right, here's the Arc de Triomphe right there. And then, yep, there's all these revolutions happening around Europe. And the people rise up. All right, that's it for me. So uh, for the rest of the day, you guys should have a uh, vocabulary sheet to fill out about everything French Revolution related. And the next class, we will have a test on the French Revolution and Napoleon. Okay, peace out.